I also uh, am in tune with our lesson this morning, and I appreciate John's question to me when I came in. Are you awake? I am indeed awake. I've been awake for several, several hours. What I do along about 5, 30, 6 o'clock, I go over my lesson again, and then I leave the house a little before 8, and that gets me safely, the Lord willing, to be with this wonderful congregation. And have wonderful brethren at that. And we'll go through that some this morning as well. And I appreciate William reading the passage to us, taken from Luke chapter 17, an indicator of probably the most thankful person in the world, at least at that time in his life, this man that was healed of leprosy and returned to do a very important thing, and that was to give thanks and to express his appreciation and his adoration for the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it's a wonderful passage. And we want to set the scene just before we delve deeply. In... Come out. So here is one person that I think is thankful and probably one of the most thankful, as I've mentioned, in the Bible. And this is our man taken with leprosy. And as our graphic, our drawing shows, he could not always associate with people that were around him. He had to avoid people. He had to stay away from people. And so here he is. And he is along with others as well. But he had to stay away from people. Therefore, not only did he have a serious disease, but notice that he was emotionally, psychologically, sociologically, he was in isolation. There was no opportunity rather to associate with anyone other than those who were experiencing the same health dynamic, and that is leprosy. Otherwise, he was an outcast from society. So we have two strikes here, as it were, with this individual. One was his physical health, and I believe further also his mental health. Being isolated from others, not a very pleasant experience. And then he was commanded by Jesus, along with the other nine, that as they were being healed, he had to go and show himself to the priests so that the protocol in the Old Testament could be fulfilled that he would be pronounced healthy and that his flesh was whole and clean and clear again. So this sets the scene a little bit, I believe, for our scripture passage here in Luke chapter 17. And as we look at the passage, we see that there are 10 as Jesus was traveling between Samaria and Galilee into a village, precisely the village, we're not exactly sure, but it was along the border between those two provinces. Nevertheless, these 10 knew from whatever they may have heard, from whatever they may have discovered, that Jesus had the power to heal them as a result. They do not with any hesitation. They do not with any equivocation. They cry out, Jesus, save us, heal us. And so they knew that Jesus possessed that power. And as I mentioned, he gave the command, go show yourself to the priests. And we see a picture here in our graphic, evidently of them doing this very thing. So one of them, when he saw that he was healed, back to our passage now, when he saw that he was healed, he came back and praising God, not in a quiet voice. <laughs> thank you, Lord. You can hear him say, thank you, Lord. And he was praising God so that it was absolutely abundantly certain what he was doing and why he was doing it. His motivation was certainly preeminent. And he throws himself at Jesus' feet. And he's a Samaritan. 
And Jesus asked, were not ten cleansed? Yes, they were. Ten were indeed cleansed. And where are the other nine? Who knows? They're not there with the Samaritan. Has no one returned to give praise, praise to God for what God has just demonstrated and accomplished in the ten lepers' lives? Only one, except this foreigner. And that's an important word for us because it has to do with our word Zeno from xenophobia, fear of strangers, a foreigner here. And then Jesus said very importantly to him, rise, rise, and then go, because your faith has healed you and made you whole. And so we see here the individual before Jesus bowing prostrate, acknowledging the power of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to do great things, particularly in this situation, to heal one from a very dreaded and difficult and challenging disease. So only one returns to give thanks. And there is a joy. I'm sure that all 10 of them experienced the joy of being healed. And unless we've experienced some health difficulties, maybe we may not fully appreciate that. And I don't mean that in a judgmental way. But when you listen to folks who have experienced serious health complications and somehow or another, and certainly if they're in the Lord, they can be blessed and they come through this gauntlet of emotion, this gauntlet of whether they will be healed or not. And that is a challenging mental situation with which one may have to live and experience for a while. And then they get through the gauntlet. There is remission. There is healing. There is restoration of a degree of health. And there is a joy, an emotional joy. And these 10 men experience that kind of joy but again we have only our thankful leper the one that was healed and returns to give thanks and he bows at jesus feet this individual had probably a rare spiritual situation a rare spiritual heart he had a grateful heart very grateful Nothing could hold him back from giving thanks and praise to God for the blessing that he had just experienced in his life. In 1 Chronicles 16, it's a beautiful chapter, a couple of verses in there that are golden nuggets, as we say, spiritual golden nuggets. One is, oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, Make known his deeds amongst the people. And certainly Jesus typifies that in this episode in his life's event in Luke chapter 17. Skipping down a few verses again in verse give thanks and give thanks because of the Lord's love and that he is good and that he cares for us. Give thanks to the Lord, which is the touchstone of our theme this morning. So stranger foreigner, let's look at the, that term there for just a moment. We see here that at least in Luke chapter 17 and 18, when Jesus, verse 18, when Jesus applies the term foreigner to our Samaritan leper, here's what it means. It means uh, allogenes, of another race, a foreigner, a guest, stranger. And so here is the word allogenes. And Jesus is saying he's not the same race, perhaps, as the other nine. They may have all been Jewish, 
but here we have a Samaritan. And we have also the word Zeno that I mentioned. And when Jesus says in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 35, for I was hungry and you gave me food and I was thirsty and you gave me drink. And I was a stranger. I was a Zeno. But you welcomed me in. You took me in. So here's where Jesus is. And it shows us that Jesus was traveling. You can see the blue there, Samaria. And above Galilee. And Jesus was traveling along the area perhaps of Nain, right there on the border between the two provinces, when he was essentially hailed by the ten lepers. And so possible ask this question, it seems to me, is it possible to be ungrateful? Let's ponder that question for a moment. Now to receive God's great gift. With an ungrateful spirit, it looks like to me that perhaps nine out of the ten had this condition of heart. They didn't return to thank Jesus like the Samaritan did. And so notice furthermore what God does in his grace over all people because he loves the world. That's everyone in it. Good, not so good. That's the power of the love of God. And so what we see here, Jesus teaches us in the Sermon on the Mount. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And that is the wonder of the general grace of God as it falls upon this world for all people. Is it possible to be ungrateful? However, we have this thankful man. And I think that when Jesus, and this is a matter of interpretation now, that when he returned to thank Jesus, this played an important part, his faith, his confidence, his trust in the power of the Lord to assist him in his life both physically, spiritually. And Jesus says, your faith has healed you. And I believe that this man was in a more acceptable state to God because of his thankful heart. And Jesus acknowledges his faith that brings him to contrition and to praise before the Lord by falling at Jesus' feet. So here we have 10 people who were healed. And I sort of like this little slide because it says 10 lepers are leaping. <laughs> Indeed, they were leaping because they had been healed of this dreaded disease. Now, there's only nine character, eight characters here, not 10, but it illustrates the point. Nonetheless, of ten lepers, a leap. The thankful attitude, of course, is diametrically opposed to the ungrateful heart. We want to demonstrate and possess the thankful attitude and thankful heart. Now, God doesn't demand that we thank him. As we look through scripture, we have admonitions to be thankful to the Lord, to praise the Lord, and to acknowledge him. But I believe he is very, very pleased when we are before him in prayer and in study with a grateful heart for all the blessings that he bestowed upon us. So let us see what it says in what is termed the Thanksgiving Psalm. And that's the title the commentators put on it. Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the lands. 
serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Singing is so important when it comes to our from our hearts. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us. We are his. We're not our own. And we are his people. We're the sheep of his pasture. And further enter his gates with thanksgiving. And his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. The Lord is good. His steadfast love and do forever. Faith to all First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. A very, very beautiful and encouraging motivational passage here. Give thanks, and it's a challenge to us. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Mm -hmm. So we see several things here that emerge from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. Seven spiritual guidelines. It's a message, it's a teaching, it's a sermon unto itself. But let's traverse through them for just a moment. Rejoice always, number one. Pray continually, number two. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus, number three. And then we have number four. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. That is the word of God. But test them all, number six. Hold fast to what is good. Don't let go. And then reject every kind of evil. Great lesson here in that passage. What are we thankful for? Let's ask that to ourselves because we asked that question at the very beginning of our study together this morning. What are things that we are thankful for? And here we recall again the one who returned to say thank you. And will we be one who is always willing to go back and say before the Lord, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Will we be the one? And I'm convinced as we look to God's word that only the thankful heart, the thankful person, learns that his faith had played a role in his healing. And it's only grateful Christians, therefore, that I believe grow in their understanding of God's grace and God's mercy and God's love. And so God is pleased when we give thanks and praise him. And in the process of having and demonstrating a thankful heart, a wonderful thing happens. We learn more about God and we also learn more about ourselves. And the thankful heart shows us that we need to be thankful for many things. Now, I've asked a couple of brothers to help me with the message this morning. And when you give a lesson, you never give it by yourself. There's always a team effort involved. So let's think for a moment about some things that we're thankful for. And I'm going to ask William to just stand and say two or three things that he's thankful for. Please, brother. Amen. Amen, brother. Thank you. Wonderful. I've also asked Brother Bob to stand and say some things that he's thankful for. I too am thankful for my Lord. Amen. Thank you, Brother Bob. And the reason I ask these two brothers to stand is to help us begin to fill out our list of 10 things that we're thankful for. And they've said some things, if you will, if you grew up, grew up in the farm country like I did in the Central Valley, when you say prime the pump, we know what you mean. It's getting things started. 
And Brother William and Brother Bob, they primed the spiritual pump for us today to help us to begin to think about things that we're thankful for that maybe we haven't thanked the Lord in some time for these wonderful blessings. And we need to do that. So a little spiritual challenge. Write down your list of 10 things that you're thankful for that the Lord has blessed you and yours. And there's always something to be thankful for before the Lord. There's always something we can be thankful for. And thus Paul says, as he writes to the Christians at Colossae, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. How not to be thankful? Now that's an interesting question. Another part of our lesson today, how to not be thankful. And we can see here that there is in the last days, according to the letter that Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy, the second letter, chapter 3, notice the part of the passage that's underlined especially. Because it says there that in the last days, and we are in the last days, people are going to come. And what are they going to do? They will be lovers of themselves. They will be lovers of money. They will be proud. They will be arrogant. They will be disobedient. And they will be disobedient to their parents. And another terrible characteristic of folks of this mentality is that they will be ungrateful. They will not have a grateful heart. This is a long passage. I can't go through all of it. It's a lesson in and of itself in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. But I call it your attention at the end of this passage, at least in verse 5. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased. And this is a record of what God was dealing with in the Old Testament with his children, the children of Israel. And now here in 1 Corinthians 10, the Apostle Paul is summing up the experiences of where the children of Israel did not always follow what God wanted done. And so we see here that with most of them, God was not pleased and they were overthrown in the desert. But we want to ask the question, why was God not pleased with them? And what we see, of course, is in verse 10 of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So they grumbled and they murmured against the Lord. They complained continually against the Lord. And so as some of them did, and they were eventually destroyed by the destroyer. So now the rabble, it says there, as they were traveling out of Egypt, the rabble stirs up the children of Israel, gets them worked up. And they come to this kind of a mentality now. They change from trusting the Lord. They think about what they had in the past. And the things in the past they thought were so good, even better than the things now. And so they cry out, oh, that we had meat to eat. And remember the fish we ate in Egypt for nothing. We didn't have to pay for it. And the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic, but now our strength is dried up and there's nothing to eat but this manna. Now think about that. The Lord was raining the bread of heaven upon them. And they were not hungry. And I'm sure that manna was probably some of the best tasting stuff any chef could ever put together. And yet they were complaining. They were murmuring. And here is the passage now in chapter 14 of the book of Numbers. And the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron, How long shall this wicked congregation murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the people of Israel, which they murmur against me, say to them, As I live, says the Lord, what you have said in my hearing I will do. And their complaining for whatever reason got through to the Lord. But they were murmuring. They were complaining. 
And the Lord says, I'll take care of the matter. So the Lord bends to, as it were, the murmuring of, murmuring of the people to take care of them and see that they were okay. And so you have murmured against me. Not one shall come into the land which I swore that would make you dwell. I would make you dwell except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Because the people murmured, and that's why they were not fully blessed and could not be fully blessed. And it says again, and the whole congregation of the people of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. But they were given manna from heaven, bread from heaven, but they kept murmuring against the Lord. And so scripture tells us in the New Testament, notice here, do all things without, without dis. And in the sense there, innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. So if we murmur, this scripture is teaching, we dim and we lower our spiritual influence and our spiritual impact upon the lives of others. And let me ask you a simple question. Do you enjoy being around some planes all the time? Not me. I'm not there. That's so negative. After a while, it begins to grate on you. It truly does. And that's murmuring. That's exactly what it is. And murmuring can cause spiritual damage. These are murmurers, complainers, following their own passions, loud-mouthed boasters, flattering people to gain advantage. The words of Jude, centered upon murmuring. So murmuring is actually against God. In the Old Testament, they were not murmuring against Moses and Aaron. And this is what Scripture says. Your murmurings are not against us. This is what Moses and Aaron say. You can murmur to us, but you're really not murmuring to us. You're murmuring to the Lord himself. That's who you're murmuring against. Murmuring is a grievous spiritual condition. Sign of an ungrateful heart. It's what it is. And it's harmful to everyone involved or impacted. And when God's people murmur, they're showing that their hearts were not truly focused on the Lord, but upon themselves. Not upon the love of the Lord, but the love of themselves. So there are various forms of the word murmur. Forty times in the Bible, it's a significant term if you do a word study. And so our song should be, thanks for your many blessings, Lord. Help us to name them one by one. Thanks for your many blessings. See what God has done in our lives. For example, are we thankful for our spiritual family? Remember, I started the lesson this morning with a simple statement. We have wonderful brothers and sisters in Christ at Pleasant View. Are we thankful for our brothers and sisters in Christ? Here's what Paul says. I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in uh, my prayers. And we remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your enduring, your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as Paul was traveling, and many of us travel in America, and so he was headed toward Rome, and this is the end of Acts, the book of Acts, yeah. chapter 28. And the brothers and sisters, they heard about Paul coming. And they go out to meet him, to greet him, and to welcome him. And they heard that we were coming, and they traveled as far as the form 
of Appius, the Appian Way, and the three taverns to meet us. And at the sight of these people, Luke says, Paul thanked God right then and there for brothers and sisters in Christ. And Paul was encouraged by their coming out to meet him and greet him. And so let the praise of Christ rule in your hearts, a thankful heart. And since we're members of one body, you are called to peace and be thankful. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and being thankful. Always and for everything, giving thanks in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to the God, to, to our God and Father. And then Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, it is solid. Let us be thankful and worship God acceptably with fear, respect, and awe. The other nine, they went off. Where they went, we don't know. But they were free, they were cleansed from their leprosy. And the word cleansed there in that passage, catharizo, is from which we get our word catharsis. When you do a catharsis, you cleanse your emotional level so that what is hurting is taken away. And so catharsis here is what happened to the 10 lepers. They were healed. And the nine were not necessarily free from sin through the salvation of Jesus Christ that he could offer. But I believe Jesus, as my analysis of the passage, offered that very thing to the Samaritan who returned. So this man was freed. So Jesus sent him on his way. And he went with the knowledge that his faith and obedience to Christ made him well. He not only had a restored body, as I mentioned, he had a restored spirit. And so Luke is emphasizing in this passage, it seems to me, again, my analysis, that God's love, God's mercy, and God's grace is for everyone. For everyone. Let us be thankful as we conclude our lesson. For God's blessings, especially as our brothers have mentioned, and I'm so appreciative that they helped me with my sermon this morning, being thankful for salvation in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Let us be a thankful people of heart, mind, and soul. And we trust that you will be thankful to your Lord and be thankful to the Heavenly Father. And we have an invitation song of encouragement. And this morning, it's a challenge to encourage all of us to have thankful hearts and be obedient to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is the thankful heart that is also the obedient heart. If you're not a Christian, we want to encourage you to be become so. If you're a brother or sister that needs prayers and encouragement, the invitation song is for all of us as we stand in church. John? When this passing world is gone, when has sunk yon glaring sun, when I stand with Christ on high, Looking o'er life's history, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then how much I owe. When I stand before the throne, dressed in beauty not my own, when I see thee as thou art, love thee with unsinning heart, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then how much I owe. When 
the praise of heaven I hear, loud as thunders to the ear, loud as many waters noise, sweet as heart melodious voice, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then how much I owe. E'en on earth as through a glass, darkly let thy glory pass. Make forgiveness feel so sweet, make thy spirit's help so meet. E'en on earth, Lord, make me know something of how much I owe. Please be seated. As always, thank you, Doug. Thank you so much. You know, there's an old saying, and it goes like this. It's a question. What have you done for me lately? Are we like that with God? I'd like to read something from Exodus chapter 19, verse 6. Moses wrote, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. We fast forward into the New Testament. Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, 9, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. Just as the Jews were God's chosen people, we as Christians now are God's chosen people. As Doug pointed out in his lesson, are we sometimes ungrateful? Does it take, will it take a stranger or a new convert to help us to appreciate, again, what God has really done for us. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Father, we just thank you so much. We thank you for our very lives. We thank you for the fact that we are either standing here or sitting here today, alive and well and worshiping you. Help us, Lord, to count the many blessings that we have in our lives. Despite what is going on, what might seem to be negative trials or tribulations, each and every one of us has so many things we could be thankful for. We ask, Lord, that we always have a thankful and grateful heart. Father, forgive us when we sometimes seem to be ungrateful. Let us love one another and be thankful for each and every thing that you give to us each and every minute of every day. We thank you, Father. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We are prepared to participate in collection of communion. We'll say, give your 42 a common love. <laughs> A common love for each other, a common gift to the Savior, a common bond holding us to the Lord. A common strength when we're weary a common hope for tomorrow, a common joy in the truth of Today's scripture reading for collection is going to be 2 Corinthians verses 9, or chapter 9, verses 11 through 15. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, 
they will thank God. So two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met, and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God. For your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. And they will pray for you with deep affection because of the over overflowing grace God has given to you. Thank God for this gift, too wonderful for words. As we give our collection today, let us remember with all our hearts just how little God owes us and how much we owe to him and to each other for the love that he has bestowed upon us and that the love that we should show in kind. Let us pray for, pray for the collection. Lord, we come to you today with our hearts open to give. As we do so, we pray that you will shine through us and help our generosity glorify you and lift up the congregation and those of the community. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. And Communion Ham six hundred ninety one was on that night. Mm. Was on that night when doomed to know the ignorance of every fall, the night in which he was betrayed, the Savior of this world took bread. And after thanks and glory give to him that rules in earth and heaven, that symbol of this flesh he broke, and thus to all this followers spoke. My broken body thus I give for you, for all, take it and live. And all the sacred history new that brings my wondrous love to view. Then in his hand the cup he raised, and God anew he thanked and prayed. While kindness in his bosom flowed, and from his lips salvation flowed, my blood I die pour forth, he cries to cleanse the soul, then sin thy life. Partake and wear the cup before. Remember still my dying hour. Amen.
volume after communion, 853. God is so good. Communion scripture is going to be 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 25. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. As we partake in communion to remember the sacrifice that was made for us, let us remember that there are no longer any chosen people who were born chosen, but rather those who have become chosen by accepting the one Lord in their heart. Let us pray for the bread. Dear Father in heaven, as we prepare to partake in this communion and partake in taking this bread, which represents your body, let us be thankful, Lord, thankful for your sacrifice for us, for your salvation that you have gifted to us. Uh, we pray and ask that you would bless this bread. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In like manner, let us pray for the cup. Holy God, we thank you. You did it for us. So we are saved. In Jesus' name pray. Amen.
Well, we have one other thing to be thankful for, and that is a fine lesson by Brother Doug Three. Uh, you're all welcome to come back tonight to hear uh, a lesson from Caleb Daniels. He's he's also a ministry intern from the Santa Clara Church of Christ. He'll be preaching for us this evening. We got uh, a few things to go over real quick with you. This coming Saturday, December the 2nd, will be our holiday party here at the building, 5.30 to 8.30. There's a, a flyer in the bulletin. There's a flyer in the foyer. There's no reason for you not to come now. Uh, but Carly and Joanna need to know who's coming so that food preparations can be made. Uh, December 10th, we're doing cookie decorating after classes. Uh, December 31st, there will be a potluck after the evening service, and we will be hanging around and playing games till, I don't know, maybe the next year. Uh, and January 1st, speaking of the new year, January 1st, we begin our annual Daniel Fast. If you haven't done that, it's a very spiritual thing that uh, we've been doing, I don't know, the last four or five years. Seems to knock a few pounds off of people. Uh, if you're inter interested in it, though, however, see, see Kelly, she'll, she'll give you the scoop. And uh, Operation Christmas Child, I got word from Tina that this congregation here produced 84 shoe boxes of, of items to go to distant lands. We did 84 shoe boxes all total this congregation at the, the gathering center, which it was. We packed... Uh, we received 356 shoe boxes that we took to the distribution center. And one more thing, Don and Gwen Minor have tested positive for COVID. Keep them in your prayers, Don and Gwen Minor. John? On December 10th, we're having a young man named Nick Westberg. Um, he's from Tulare. He's uh, the family minister in the church there. He's going to be coming here on Sunday morning on December 10th to preach for us. So would love everybody to be here if possible. And we want to get as much feedback on him as possible afterwards. So just keep that on your calend calendars, December 10th. Thank you. Closing in 975. Let's stand and sing together. Thank you, Lord. Nine seven five. <laughs> For all that you've done, I will thank you. For all that you're going to do. 
For all that you've promised and all that you are is all that has carried me through. Jesus, I thank you. And I thank you, thank you, Lord. And I thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you for loving and setting me free. Thank you for giving your life just for me. Now I thank you. As a leaf, thank you. Gratefully thank you. Thank you. And I thank you, thank you, Lord. And I thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you for loving and setting me free. Thank you for giving your life just for me, now I thank you. Jesus, I thank you. Gratefully thank you. Thank you. Please so remain standing. Let us pray together. Our dear Heavenly Father, we, we are so thankful that each of us woke up this morning and we're able to come here to, and worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you for all our brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you for Doug's wonderful lesson today that helped us to focus on you and, and the things that we are thankful for. May we Think upon these things each and every day as we pray to you in our silent moments. Oh, Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who willingly went to the cross and died there for our transgressions. What a wonderful and perfect plan you had for us. Oh, Heavenly Father, we pray that as we depart, that we would think upon this lesson, that we would uh, make the application in our lives and be thankful each and every day. We pray for opportunities that would come our way to be able to speak to others about your saving grace. Oh, Heavenly Father, may we focus upon your word this week. May we, in our words, thoughts, and deed, glorify you. We praise you. We love you. Please watch over us as we depart and, and bless us this week. Oh, Heavenly Father, we pray for those who were not here this morning. We, whether that be from, from illness, we pray that you would heal them and make them whole, that they can uh, be back in worship with us the next appointed time. In this we pray in Jesus' most holy and humble name. Amen. Yeah. We're dismissed. <laughs>